This episode contains discussion of hazing. Listener discretion is advised. At 19 years old, Tucker Hips was a sophomore at Clemson University in South Carolina. Tucker was a pledge at the Sigma Phi Epsilon fraternity when he lost his life. The mysterious circumstances surrounding his death and his fraternity brother's lack of help led to many suspecting them of wrongdoing. Was Tucker's death just a tragic accident like they claimed, or was there much more to the story and events that led to Tucker's death? All right, well, we've got a... A diff- I, I would say a different kind of case. I don't think we've covered many hazing cases, if any. So. Right. Um, it's definitely a problem. It's scary. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to talk about it today. Yes, I think that that is important and that's what we should do. Yes, we would like to give a Hey Girl thanks to Caitlin Pritchett. For requesting this case and to Mark for writing it up. Yes, thank you guys so much. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about Tucker Hips. Uh, born in June of 1995 to Gary and Cindy Hips, Tucker was a vivacious young man growing up. And Cindy herself said that Tucker was born to an old couple. Um, they were a little older when he was born. She was 35 at the time, which obviously is not old, but you know, that was kind of her joke. Like they didn't, they hadn't planned on having children and he came a little later. Um, so she kind of just always joked that they were, you know, old when he was born. Um, and you know, they hadn't planned on having kids, but once they did, I mean, Tucker was like the light of their lives. Gary said that growing up, he and Tucker played a lot. They just had a really good time together. They said that Tucker always had a twinkle in his eye and his personality always showed through in whatever he was doing. Um, even at a young age, he was devout in his faith. He accepted Christ into his life at 10 years old. His family attended Rock Springs Baptist Church, where Tucker was really active in the youth groups and church sporting activities. And he he was just one of those kids who was like into everything. Mm -hmm. He was very, very active. He was a busy kid. Um, He was also involved in Palmetto Boys State. Um, And he was involved in that pretty much... I mean, most of his life growing up, he was a senior counselor there. And Boys State is a program put together by the American Legion. And they describe the program like this, uh, quote, the American Legion's Boys State program is a unique way for young men to learn about the American system of government and politics by participating in a mock governmental system. And they also have a girl state for for young women as well. Um, From what we gather, it's a week-long program. It's kind of like a summer camp, um, but this is where young men go. They participate in activities to learn about different positions and levels of government. And when applying, prospective attendees have to have recommendations from teachers, counselors, prominent members of like their community, Um, And they said that the program teaches leadership skills on top of the government education. Now, while there, they're broken up into groups, and over the course of the week, they compete in athletics, trivia, and various events and activities. They also have the opportunity to hear from some of South Carolina's, because this is in South Carolina, um, some of their current leaders, as many of them were attendees of Palmetto Boys State themselves. So of a full circle situation. I could Mm -hmm. see how something like that would look good on a college application or something like that. Absolutely. Um, In high school, Tucker was popular among other students. He was well liked by everyone who met him. He was bubbly. Uh, Like we said, he was always into something. Um, He just was not a kid who was, who wanted to sit around and like watch TV. and there's nothing wrong with relaxing and watching TV, but he was just a very, very active kid. Um, his dad described him as basically the quintessential all-American kid. Um, and he said, you know, when you think of that term, like what you picture is Tucker. In school, Tucker was a three-sport athlete. 
He was drawn to sports and the outdoors at a very early age. As a family, the hips were always going and doing something sports related with Tucker or for Tucker. When you ask people he grew up with, one of the things that you hear over and over is that you will never meet someone who was more personable and there for you. His parents said that when it came to materialistic things, Tucker was unlike a lot of the other kids. Um, they, you know, they said, like anyone, he loved having new things, of course. Like all, most people like to have new things. But um, if you gave him the choice between a new toy or item or whatever it is, or saying, or you, we can take this money and do get you like an experience, go and do something with friends or family, he would pick the experience or spending time with friends or family 100% of the time. They said it, it was always the choice for him. I feel um, like that reminds me a lot of your husband. I was just going to say that is very much my husband. Yeah. He like, he was also like growing up, he's still this way. He won't wear a shirt that has a logo on it. Mm -hmm. He wears just plain t-shirts. Like he's like, why would I pay them to advertise for their company? Like, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but he would definitely pick the spending time 100%. And when you grow up in the area that Tucker grew up in and you're looking at colleges to attend after high school, there are generally two types of people. There are the people who eat, sleep, and breathe Clemson University. And then there are the people who they just want to go to a rival school of Clemson. It's like... It, there's kind of like no in between. It's one or the other. Like, yep, all or nothing. Yeah. Founded in 1889, Clemson has a 1400 acre campus in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It borders Lake Hartwell and also a nearby 17,500 acre area, the Clemson Experimental Forest, which the school manages and uses for research, education, and recreation. Throughout the years, many athletes, musicians, authors, congressmen, senators, and a governor or two have attended Clemson, and Tucker couldn't wait to attend himself. Um, my father-in-law attended Clemson and played football there, so he, like our family, eats, breathes, and sleeps UT, Knoxville. Um but if UT plays Clemson, my father-in-law is rooting for Clemson. So, um, and I went there with a friend for a football game. I was maybe 18, 19, something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a beautiful campus. It's so pretty. I fell in love with it. And I was like, I want to go to Clemson when I go to college. And then I didn't go to college, but. You went to college for a little bit until you fell down. Until I fell down, yeah. You were very serious about it until you fell down. Well, yeah. Good thing I didn't go to Clemson because that would have been a, a lot more money wasted because if I'd fallen down at Clemson and had to leave. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yikes. Exactly. So let's talk about the day of September 22nd, 2014. And that in September, Tucker was a sophomore at Clemson. He was also pledging a fraternity, which was Sigma Phi Epsilon. And when he made his decision to join a fraternity, it wasn't a decision that Tucker made alone. His parents had their reservations, but there was an orientation at Clemson, which they talked about the benefits of joining a fraternity. Specifically, students in fraternities had a higher average GPA and grades, and they had better time management skills generally, and in the right circumstances, had a group they could turn to and fall back on if they needed help while in school away from family and friends. So. As a family, they thought it was a good idea for Tucker to join and have that brotherhood away from home. Tucker chose the fraternity because he planned on attending law school after Clemson, and the membership might prove useful in getting an internship down the road. On the morning of Tucker's death, members of the fraternity went on a pre-dawn early morning run, and there were 25 plus members of the fraternity on that run that morning. But while on that run, they went over a bridge above Lake Hartwell. And some would later say that on the bridge, they noticed that Tucker lagged behind, but they assumed that he would catch up. They thought maybe he needed to catch his breath or maybe one of his shoes had come untied so he had to stop and tie it back. Um, something along those lines. So they just kept going without him. The run occurred sometime around 5.30 a.m. and no one knew anything was amiss until Tucker didn't show up for the fraternity breakfast at 7 a.m. 
they looked around the house and they noticed that Tucker's keys and cell phone were still in the same spot where the other fraternity brothers instructed the pledges to leave their things before they went on this run. The pledges continued to look for Tucker after discovering the keys and the phone, but no one reported anything to authorities. They retraced their steps over the morning, but no one found Tucker, and finally around 1.45 p.m., Campbell Starr, member of the fraternity, called campus police asking for information concerning Tucker. And we will listen to the 911 call. Clemson University Police are fire. Hi, um, I'm, uh, I'm calling to see if uh, this, earlier this morning or some point today y'all picked up a, uh, like a 19-year-old guy, like brown hair. He's like my buddy. I'm looking for him. Where was the last place you were seeing your buddy? Uh, we went for a run this morning. Uh, was he sick or depressed no, or anything? No, see, I don't know. He, we didn't think he was or anything like that's what we're, we don't want to like file a report yet. I just want to see if y'all like could t- help us out right a little bit. And were you running on campus or off campus? Uh, we started on campus and we like went across. We were going towards Seneca down by the lake. We like went to the bridge and came back. Um, did you backtrack? Yeah, we we, just, we went and we ran the entire area. We like went to the woods and everything. And no signs of him. No. Okay, what is his name? That way, in case we get a <laughs> medic call or anything. I don't really want to do a report yet. It's interesting. They can't find him. So allegedly, they can't find him. And they're, he, what, this is, good God in heaven, um, what, eight, almost nine hours after the run? Right, yeah. And, or a little bit less, eight, eight and a half hours after the run. And they just call 911, or the, the campus security or whatever to the 911 call they call to ask have you just seen somebody on the side of the road like it's just it's very bizarre the way that it went down i can see from a 19 20 21 year olds maybe point of view that like okay he like did he just change his mind and go do something else or you know it On the call, it doesn't sound like he's that worried. It just seems like, you know, something happened and maybe he got picked up. Like, he keeps saying that. He doesn't doesn't even sound like he suspects a medical emergency. He sounds like he's just like, well, we got separated, but we'll find him. And they even talk about, well, is it possible he just went on about his day? Did he go to classes? And... You know, he says, no, well, we went to his apartment. He wasn't there. Um, Obviously, they still have his keys in his phone, so that becomes concerning. Um, He's definitely pretty adamant that he doesn't want to file a report. Right. Um, But I don't know. I I, I guess, like, playing devil's advocate, like, I could see it both ways. Like, if you're looking at this as this person knows that something happened and he's trying to cover it up or whatever, but you could also look at it as, I mean, there's plenty of times where I have maybe felt something was, you know, wrong and I didn't want to say anything because I don't want to make a big deal out of nothing and then I'll look silly and, you know, blah, 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 and it'll waste resources or, you know, maybe he's just off doing something regular yeah. and now I've called the police or whatever. I don't know. This could be one of those situations where I know too much because of the way that the case has evolved. And, you know, I I know the outcome, but I just, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of strange because any 18-year-old kid is not going to leave without maybe their keys, maybe, but probably not their cell phone. Mm -mm. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. And go that long throughout the day. Like, I could understand if directly after the run, this call happening and him being like, I, you know, let's not get hasty about making a report. Like, that's, you know, but this is now eight and a half hours after. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. I don't know. That's, that's all I'm saying is just, yeah. The lack of, um, hey, we got to do something or, I don't know, contacting his parents. Like, th- there could have been a right. lot of things that yeah. I feel have like could have happened. Yeah, you seen him? Yeah. After this eight and a half hours of not seeing him. I don't uh, know. It's 100%. Just, yeah. Yeah. 911, the dispatcher, they discussed 
the events that led them to not being able to find Tucker and went over the path that they took during the run, specifically going over the bridge and around the lake. So the brothers are, they're retracing their steps, right? And the dispatcher asked, you know, have you backtracked? And he was like, yeah, we ran the route again and even checked the woods along the route, but there was no sign of Tucker anywhere. And the dispatcher asked for Tucker's name and Campbell said it again. And of course he was like, you know, very adamant. We don't want to file a report here. And she was like, look, if I, just in case, right? Like if, if there's a medical emergency or something, I need to know the name. Mm -hmm. So. So that I know to call you and let you know that we found him. Absolutely. I did also think that it was strange listening to this because she says, when is the last time you saw your buddy? And he is like on the run. And she's like, okay, yeah, I know you saw him at some point on the run. And then he's like, yeah, well, when we got back, we realized he wasn't here, which would have been seven in the morning. But specifically where on the run is the last time you saw him? Like, right. He doesn't specifically mention here, I noticed he was lagging behind or because clearly the last time you would have seen him would have been before they got to the bridge. Right. It, it would have to be. But he just says, yeah, when we were running, we were all together. Um, yeah, but somewhere I under- along that. <laughs> yeah, I understand that you just assume everybody's there if you're in a group. But when it, when is the last time you saw him? Mm-hmm. When did you see him? Like, right. He's just very vague. Very, very vague. And that's confusing to me. Like, uh, and of course, like I said, I know too much. So maybe that's why I don't know. But around 2.15 p.m., officers began searching near the bridge that Campbell Starr told the dispatcher about. Around 3.30 p.m., an officer spotted a body in the water and it turned out to be Tucker. Authorities launched a death investigation. Around 5.15 p.m., rescue divers recovered Tucker's body from the shallow water around the bridge, and it was less than 10 feet from the shoreline. At 6.30 p.m., investigators left the area of the bridge and lake. At 7.50 p.m., the sheriff's office announced that they recovered a body from the lake, and at 8.40 p.m., the coroner identified the body as Tucker officially. So, investigators talked with everyone who was on the run that morning. They all told the same basic story. Essentially the same thing that Campbell told the police dispatcher when he had placed that call. So they all met, they went out for that run, they left their keys and phones at the frat house. Once they got back home and noticed Tucker wasn't there for breakfast, they started to look for him. They didn't find him and eventually contacted the police. So the autopsy showed that Tucker died of head injuries consistent with having hit rocks in the shallow water near the end of the bridge. But that's pretty much all investigators had to go on. The members of the fraternity basically all lawyered up and stopped assisting in the investigation. And that was it for a long time. Investigators kept trying to get more and more information, but absolutely no one would talk. After interviewing more than 50 people about what happened to Tucker the day he disappeared, it became clear to everyone that there was a lot more to the story than they were being told, but again, nobody is willing to speak up. Um, There were rumors that were going around the campus as well. Many of these rumors involved Tucker's frat brothers, especially a brother named Sam Carney, whose dad also happens to be the current governor of Delaware. Many of the rumors mention cover-ups by the fraternity and Clemson University to protect the members of the frat because of who their parents are. And there is one thing to keep in mind about people who attend Clemson who are not on a scholarship or receive any grants or significant financial aid. It's not a cheap college by any means. I mean, this is not, you know, certainly you can go to a college without financial aid, but... You have to have a certain level of money to be able to attend a college like Clemson. It's not Mm -hmm. like where we are, MTSU, or even like Motlow, the community college. Like the financial difference is pretty large. It seemed like like a lot of people will say this about Clemson. They view it to be expensive. And if you're going there not on a scholarship, you're probably either going to be in debt for most of your life or you come from money. And if you look at the population there, it's mostly the latter. Um, You know, we're 
we're talking about typically families who have that generational wealth and typically people whose families are in positions of power, family members, like things like that. I mean, like with Sam Carney, I mean, his dad's a, a governor, like that's a pretty big deal. Yep. With that in mind, we can talk about the most often mentioned and believed theory as to what happened. Supposedly, a witness has come forward and talked to authorities off the record. Um, and Tucker's parents have filed wrongful death suits, which contain more details. So, and a, a lot of people will file wrongful death suits in order to have people deposed and force them to talk. It's not mm-hmm. for the money that they think they can gain or whatever. It's to get information because otherwise they don't have to say anything. Um, And these people are not saying anything. So in lawsuits filed by Tucker's parents, they claim that before the run was scheduled to take place because also pre-dawn runs like this had been banned by the university before this. Mm Mm-hmm. So one of the brothers sent Tucker a text and told him to bring breakfast for everyone. And again, he's a pledge, so he has to do whatever they tell him, right? Right. He said, get 30 McDonald's biscuits, 30 hash browns, and two gallons of chocolate milk. I also just feel like that highlights that these are still kids we're talking about. Like, like get the food, but don't you forget that chocolate milk. Two gallons of it. Two gallons, two gallons. Okay. and. The, I know I'm kind of stepping on your point here, but that's a lot of food for an 18-year-old kid in college to have to come up with. Like, that's, I mean, that's a lot of money at McDonald's to spend. 30 biscuits, 30 hash browns, two gallons yeah, of chocolate milk. At like damn near 75 bucks or something, probably. That's a lot for somebody yeah. who was in college. Like, mm-hmm. Exactly. And Tucker said, I don't have enough money to cover that. And so he was told, collect it from the other pledges then. Is there not, like, money in the fraternity for stuff like that? Like, I've I've never been in a sorority or a fraternity, I guess, Um, speaking candidly here. So I don't know if there's something, like, petty cash that they have or something. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like, but... if we're going to do, like, um, you know a business lunch the podcast would pay for that you know so like is there not some kind of i mean you ha- you have to pay dues to be in this right like yeah where does that money go so if you're going to do if you're going to do a an organizational fraternity breakfast yeah why should a pledge have to pay for that out of their own pocket i don't know i mean and i guess that's a taking advantage of the pledge thing like, oh, you're a pledge, so I you guess, have to do it. Right, yeah. It's like put him through the paces kind of thing. Yeah, but it just seems like, I don't know. I know there's like bigger f- fish to fry here, but it, it bothers me. And I'm like... Well, but maybe not, though. Maybe this is part of the bigger fish to fry, though. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It just, yeah, it's like, how am I supposed to come up with that money? I'm in school full time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So... He was told to get it from the other pledges, but for whatever reason, they didn't have the money. They ended up not, whatever, they ended up not doing it. So they show up to the run and they don't have the food. Now, the person who had contacted Tucker and told him to bring all the breakfast, Brian Golnick, was pretty mad about this. And he then called another brother, Thomas King, and angrily told him that Tucker and the other pledges had the audacity to not bring the breakfast they were told to bring. And while on the run, they allege that King asked Tucker to stay back with him on the bridge and that King had confronted him on the bridge. And then the next thing they know, Tucker has gone over the rail. If this is true, this sweet young man lost his life over biscuits and chocolate milk and hash browns. Mm Mm-hmm. Are you kidding me? Over like, McDonald's breakfast. They got carried away by that game. Right. If if that's true, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my entire life. 
A hundred percent. So just, senseless. Can't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can't. So they, they also allege that Thomas King, knowing that Tucker has gone over the rail, calls Campbell Starr, who remember, he's the one who calls 911 in the afternoon, and Sam Carney to come back and help look for Tucker. They do this by, remember, it's dark outside. It's very early. Shining their phone flashlight over the rail. Nope, don't see him. We looked everywhere. I just don't understand how any of that is at all possible because you, if, again, if this is true, you saw him go over the rail. You know he's got to be down there, right? He's not a vampire that can just, like, float back up and come back. Like, he's he's down there, right? And you're like, eh, I've looked everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Go around and go. I don't know how you get down there, but go around and go down. Go check on him. You know there's so many rocks down there. This is a place that they are familiar with. Mm -hmm. It's not like they've never been to this area. It's not like they were from out of town and this was a hike that they took as a group on a trip or whatever. Like, they know this area, so they know how to go around and get down there. Sure. And they should have known, I would think, that there are rocks. I mean, if somebody goes over a bridge like that, you need to call somebody and get them medical attention. They Somebody had their cell phone because they used it. The flashlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it seems like just the pledges couldn't have their phones. Because the pledges were instructed to leave their phones at the frat house. Why? Right. But it's, I mean, like you said, we've got at least one cell phone there. Yeah. So why did we not use it? So that, if this is true, because again, this is provided by an off-record witness who won't come forward really fully. Um, then that makes Campbell Starr's 911 call very suspicious because he says, I don't know, he was on the run and then he just wasn't there anymore. I have absolutely no idea. Can't we get phone records to corroborate this story or can we not because it's off record? See, I, yeah, I don't, surely... You could get the phone records because the likelihood that these kids didn't text each other about this or talk to each other in some way about this, I feel like is very, very unlikely. Right. Um, surely there's something there that we can come up with. But he, he also says, we went back and retraced. Presumably, you would have retraced your steps in the daylight because they said they didn't know that Tucker wasn't there until they get back at seven in the morning. Well, the sun's going to be up by then. If they go back and retrace their steps, if he's right there at the bottom, less than 10 feet from the shore, somebody would have seen him, right? Because when the police go look, they find him immediately. Right. Absolutely. So we didn't retrace our steps. No. But that's not all that the witness said. There's more to the story. So. The witness said that when they were on the bridge, they forced Tucker to get on one of the rails and uh, along the bridge and walk across. And it was a known hazing that the fraternity had forced pledges to do in the past. The witness said that at one point, Tucker was walking along the rail and he slipped. And he caught himself and he tried to pull himself back up, but he lost his grip and he fell in the shallow water headfirst. Now, let's just say... Let's just say that it's an accident. Let's say that it was a complete accident. You still have the responsibility to call that in because you don't know, accident or not accident, you don't know that he's dead at this point. He might still, there could be a life um, saving aid administered here. Yeah, that could be rendered. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. We don't know this, but you know. But there's a chance. So you have to do that. Like, if he can get to the hospital and something can be done, a surgery or whatever, and he can live. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing about this kind of stuff. You see it time and time again. The brothers will do whatever they have to do to protect the fraternity at all costs. Mm-hmm. Why? And again, if if this witness's story is true, which again, I feel like we should be able to get phone records to 
prove that this is true, but if it is, it's all over a fucking McDonald's breakfast. I just don't, I don't understand it. So, there's also a different account and of what happened and it claims that Tucker was pushed from the rail. But again, this has never been concern, confirmed or on the record. Before they called the police, one of his fellow pledges allegedly texted Tucker's girlfriend and told her that he they had seen Tucker at the library to keep her from getting alarmed when she wasn't able to find Tucker and alerting his parents or the police. And but, like that's another like you should be able to you should be able to confirm even if you de- even if that kid deleted the text message the girlfriend should be able to be like hey cuz you would you would expect that she's willing to cooperate right and i'm not saying that she's not but you should be able to confirm that or even if you even if both parties deleted it let's say they both did you can still find it 100% you can still find it and if that did happen if somebody from the fraternity texted his girlfriend to say oh he's at the library and so you probably aren't going to get in touch with him right now or whatever to buy more time yeah then I understand that's very circumstantial. It's not the smoking gun, but that tells you that they knew he wasn't where he was supposed to be. But at 1.45 p.m., they're saying, well, oh, my God, I be. still can't find him. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. But like, you knew at whatever time you texted the girlfriend. It just feels so very political. And I don't think that, like, that's, you know, some revelation. I think that we all are, like, maybe on board with, like, how political this is, but I'm just, I'm appalled. I, what I don't understand is, okay, so I have done some stupid in my life, right? But nothing to this degree, and I'm not saying that, you know, um, just, just dumb little annoying who cares things, but I, <laughs> I have been the first to tell on myself. I I don't even make it a day. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Guess what I did? Like, I remember kind of random story. It's not even that big of a deal, but in cosmetology school, because I went to cosmetology school, in cosmetology school, I was talking about my instructor behind her back. Well, here she is. And I was like, oh no, oh no. Did she, did she hear me? Did she, did she hear me? I don't know. I made it 25 minutes. I walked up to her and I was like, I'm so sorry. I was talking so much shit about you behind your back. And she was like, honey, we all do it. I didn't even hear you. Um, but thank you for apologizing. And I was like, I was like, I could have, she didn't even hear me. <laughs> but I was like, I- I'll just, I'll be the first. Like, I, I could not, ne- I don't understand this. I could, I just could not live with myself. If I was carrying around the weight of this, like, right. accidental crime, whatever it is, you know, but and, I couldn't do it. And there's so many people involved that there were 25 plus people on this run that's what i don't understand it's i i'm assuming that probably most of them didn't know about it because if they were all on the jog and then only a couple people stayed behind so then you've only got sure. three four people maybe let's say three that need to keep the secret that's still I mean, not that it's never been done, but, you know, three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. Like, Right. Absolutely. Eventually, usually it comes out. This is so many years ago at this point, and we're still... hmm Yeah. I just... I watched the press conference from the year, or the seven-year anniversary of Tucker's death. So this was that last year. That was last year. year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. hmm I think it was the police officer maybe that's involved in the investigation that's leading it now said, you know, at the time that this happened, these guys were, you know, children. They were very young. They were in college. They were in their teens, maybe early 20s. He's like, these guys are now adults and they're many of them are fathers. Uh, Many of them, you know are in their careers, they're married, they're whatever, whatever their life has taken them, but they are adults now. And he especially was kind of pleading to the ones who are fathers and being like, look, you know how you feel about your child and how you would feel if something happened to your child. And you shouldn't be a parent to have compassion for that. But, you know, you shouldn't have to be a parent to have compassion for that. But he's like, you know, especially Those of you who are now fathers, 
have compassion for these parents who need closure and need to know what happened to their child. Mm-hmm. Like. Absolutely. And nothing. Right. It's so disheartening and so awful. It's just awful. But another story claims that when King asked Tucker to stay back and to talk to him, others were there as well. And as punishment for not bringing breakfast, they dangled him over the rails by his ankles or legs and lost their grip, dropping Tucker into the water below. But basically, like we said, whatever happened, any of those scenarios or something in between, whatever happened, it's pretty clear that no one is willing to say anything more. They... The, the thing is, Tucker did not slip while he was running. It just didn't happen. There was railing. It, it just did not happen. No. I mean, to go... To go over the railing, you'd have to be standing on it, leaning over it, have been pushed, you know? And that, right. none of that... You, like... Like you said, you can't just be jogging past it. And can't slip and fall, fall and then over. just, yeah, somersault over the railing. It yeah. just did not happen. But all these stories are also very different. I don't know if they're all coming from different people. I mean, there's just a lot that we don't know because the investigation is still ongoing and it's still active and they're still trying to get the information, you know, that they can get. And obviously they don't have enough information to charge anybody with anything. Okay. Um. Which makes you wonder, you know, like you said, there's got to be some kind of phone record or something corroborating some part of any of this. Well, and like you just said, I mean, we don't know. Maybe they have and maybe they haven't found anything. Maybe this is all just hearsay theories and they've already looked into it and they're not finding any of that kind of stuff. I don't know. But yeah, well, and it it also um there's apparently a what producer or whatever who is working on a film about hazing and it seemed like I, it didn't sound like when he talked about it that it was just about Tucker's case but that Tucker's case would be part of it mm -hmm. um and he said in all the other cases where he's gone and talked to people who were in the fraternity he's always been able to get somebody to participate and give an interview. He also is able to get people from the university to give an interview. Mm -hmm. This is the only case where he's gotten nobody to talk to him. Not one person from the university, not one person from the fraternity. And he's like, I was in this fraternity. This is my fraternity. And I've tried wow. to appeal to them as a brother, like, hey, it's time to, like, what do you know? Yeah. And even if you think that you don't know anything important, your information coupled with somebody else's information could be very important. So what? But he's just like, I've never had a situation where nobody will speak to me. Nobody. Everybody has completely clammed up and they will not say anything. Not one person will come forward. That is so sad. That is awful. But... Terrella, since you brought up hazing, why don't you talk to us about hazing? Okay. Um, well, hazing is defined as any activity that is required of someone joining or participating in a group that is humiliating, dangerous, or degrading. Uh, this has been a long-standing problem on college campuses across the United States. Uh, the practice has been linked to a number of serious injuries and deaths, including those of Tucker Hips and many others before him. Uh, in fact, according to a study by the National Collaborative for Hazing Research and Prevention, approximately one in three students involved in college clubs, teams, and organizations has experienced hazing at one point in time. One in three. That is outrageous. What is wild to me, too, is like, I'm like, why is that still happening, though? <clears throat> you know, like... This is a long-standing tradition or whatever, but we know better. I know. And the people who put these traditions into place are not running these fraternities and sororities anymore. So mm -hmm. why are we carrying that down? I don't understand how that is such a big tradition and it's so 
and I don't want to say widely accepted, but I mean, you see it even in the media. Like I'm thinking specifically um, Animal House. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking because that's a very big fraternity movie, you know, but also Dazed and Confused. Ben Affleck's character, O'Bannon or whatever his name was, was making all those paddles and stuff to like they, they were hazing all of the the soon to be freshman kids. It's like or no, uh yeah, the freshman kids, yeah. Yeah, it's just like why are we carrying that through with such conviction? Right. Like what why is it so important to you? I don't know. <clears throat> um there's also um another statistic that says according to Franklin College journalism professor pro- <laughs> ah, we almost had a whole episode. I know. I was like, I'm doing so good. Nope. Journalism professor Hank Neuer, over 200 university hazing deaths have occurred since 1838, with 40 deaths being between 2007 and 2017 alone. And alcohol poisoning is the biggest cause of death, Um, which is really, really scary. I, I read or I've heard... Um, about another boy who was hazed and off the top of my head, I cannot, it's been a while since I've read about this, but, um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he was around the same age, 18, 19, whatever. Um, people in his fraternity at a party were, you know, force feeding him drinks and things like that. He fell down the stairs, a big staircase that he fell down and hit his head at the bottom and he's laying at the bottom of the stairs for something like eight or nine hours people are stepping over him at one point they grab him and drag him up the stairs and try to rouse him by like slapping his face pouring water on him when they check the the kids that were at the party's cell phones they're googling things like a head injury while drinking or can you fall asleep after a head injury like all these things this child laid there for eight or nine hours, slowly dying. I mean, he ended up going and in, slipping into a coma and he passed away from this. And his blood alcohol level when he fell down those stairs and hit his head was 0. 0.4. 0. 0.3 is like death. Oh my God. And there's video of this happening. So they tried to delete the video and they tried to get rid of their... Mm-hmm. cell phone records and all that and it all came out but the thing is too it's like i mean i don't get me wrong i enjoy a beverage but there of course it's all of these older kids influencing these younger kids maybe not even influence is the right word um bullying and hazing them into doing this kind of stuff but also they're making them once you have a couple drinks if you're not an avid or big drinker then your inhibitions, right? So then you're like, all right, another, all right, another, all right, another. When it's very clear that somebody needs to have be cut off and let's switch to water or something like that. I don't understand it. I remember I was watching the show and this guy on there was like, oh yeah, when I was in college, I think he went to FSU. And he was like, when I was in college, I remember that um, my fraternity, we had a bet to see, and I don't even know if it was a bet, but it was like, who can stay drunk the longest? And he made it to 69 days. And he was like, well, of course I stopped there because, you know, 69, whatever. (laughs) But it's like, oh my God, it's so dangerous. Like, I mean, I understand, you know, we're older now or whatever, you know, there's definitely plenty of nights where I had way too much to drink, you know, and things like that. But it's not given the reverence i guess that dessert like it can be so dangerous obviously people die from alcohol poisoning Mm -hmm. and if you are in and in this type of a situation where somebody is force feeding alcohol and things like that you know a kid trying to join a fraternity or whatever he wants to prove that he can handle his alcohol or whatever you know they're like oh you can't handle it like you know it's just i mean 21st birthdays are like that you know in some situations, like, yep. I just, I don't know. Like, I remember my husband's 21st birthday. He was, we were not married at the time and I'm three years older than him. So I'm, I'm an elderly person compared to him, yes. but we went out for his birthday and he told me before we went out, he was like, and he wasn't, it's not like he had just started drinking that night. He'd been drinking. He'd been in college, you know, like whatever. 
but he was like, of course, my friends are going to want, you know, to buy me shots everywhere that we go and like all this stuff. And he said he had already planned, like he took off work the next day and I had to. And for his birthday, he wanted us to go to Cheekwood together and like spend the day together. That's what he wanted to do. And so he said, I don't want to get too drunk tonight because I don't want to be super hungover tomorrow. Like I want to be able to get up and go do what we had planned to do. And I was like, okay. So he's like, if they start making me drink too much, like let's just go home. All right. So I hung in there as long as I could. And he got to the point where he was having trouble standing up by himself. And I was like, I'm not going to be able to carry him up the stairs, like whatever. So we're getting ready to leave. And he said he wanted to leave. I mean, he wasn't like, no, I want to stay or anything like that. Like he was like, yeah, I'm ready to go. And one of his friends was like, um, Look, I know you're old or whatever, but this is something he this is. uh-huh. This is something he needs to do. He needs to go through this. It's like a rite of passage. I get that you're old. I was like, I'm 24, dude. Like whatever. Yeah. But it was just like ridiculous. And it's just so like why? What is the point? Now, Tucker, his death wasn't caused by alcohol. Um, but I have no but doubt was, that that's part of the things that they do. Right. But it was, uh, if, if, if what we have heard, some of the theories, any of them are true, it was caused by pressure from yes. older fraternity brothers. hmm And it doesn't matter which, uh, route that takes. It's. It's still a problem. It's an abuse of power. It is you are in a position of authority to the person that you are causing to harm impress to. or something. Yeah. Oh, sure, and sure, 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 sure. So, and they are more likely to want to impress you, get through it, you know, all of those things because there's an imbalance of power there. Absolutely. You're in a position that they want to one day be in. Mm-hmm. And I think it's also so dangerous to be like, well, I did it, you know, I paid my dues. You've got to pay your dues. It doesn't always turn out fine. Right. Because there are going to be people who are going to take it way the fuck too far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because of whatever reason. But, you know, in this situation, it's possibly because they were angry because, again, a pledge had the audacity to not follow an instruction. <sighs> Anyway, anyway, Tucker's death sparked a significant amount of attention and controversy surrounding hazing and fraternity activities at Clemson University. Many students and members of the community were shocked and saddened by Tucker's death, and they called for changes to be made to prevent similar incidents from occurring in the future. In response to the incident, Clemson University implemented a number of changes to its policies related to Greek organizations including stricter regulations for hazing and alcohol use. I'm sorry. Can we just get rid of that? No hazing. Yeah. Don't do that. Well, we got to tighten it up. Uh, don't, don't mind if you do it, but let's just tighten her on up. Be, be responsible about your hazing. <sighs> Haze responsibly? Is that, is that possible? I don't think it's possible. Um, as well as increased oversight of fraternity and sorority activities. Um, Gary and Cindy Hips, which are Tucker's parents, filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the university, the fraternity, and several individuals involved in the incident. The lawsuit claimed that the fraternity and university were liable for Tucker's death due to their failure to properly supervise and regulate the activities of the fraternity. In 2019, a jury rejected all of the claims and found no fault to any of the defendants. The death of Tucker Hips serves as a tragic reminders, um, a tragic reminder of the dangers of hazing and the importance of preventing it. Universities and organizations must take steps to address this issue, including implementing stricter regulations and oversight, promoting education and awareness, and creating a culture of respect and inclusion. It's crucial to remember that hazing is not just a problem on college campuses, but also in other organizations and that it's a global problem that needs to be addressed. The case of Tucker Hips is a tragic example of how hazing can lead to severe consequences, and it's essential for organizations to take action to prevent any future incidents. In the years since Tucker's death, Sigma Phi Epsilon has closed their chapter at Clemson University. 
before Tucker's death, like we said, pre-dawn runs had been banned on campus. And the frat had actually called the university to try to get permission to do the run, but they never got the okay to do it. Nobody called him back, nobody gave him permission, so they said, let's do it anyway. And pledges were actually told to wear black or dark clothing so they wouldn't be seen when they were out. And they were claiming it was a fitness event. Sure. So my first indication that something that I'm doing is wrong is if I have to hide it. If you're going on a run in the dark, 5.30 a.m., sun's not up, it's dark. You're going to want to wear reflective clothing. If you're running on a road... And they're telling everybody to dress in totally dark clothing. Leave your cell phones and your keys behind. Come on, guys. Don't tell me you didn't know it was wrong. Right. And you knew it was banned and you did it anyway. There's a reason it's banned. Yeah, absolutely. And no answer is not a yes. Exactly. For something that's banned. I mean, like, it's just... Right. It's like, I don't need to answer you because I've already banned it. That's your answer. Right. It's still no. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Sam Carney, son of Delaware Governor John Carney, was supposedly the mastermind of the pre-dawn run and organized everything. Governor Carney and his wife expressed their condolences to Gary and Cindy, but that's the extent of it. After his death, Gary and Cindy worked tirelessly to pass legislation against hazing. The Tucker Hips Transparency Act states that all public institutions of higher education, excluding technical colleges, must provide a public report of actual findings of violations of the institution's conduct of student organizations by fraternity and sorority organizations formally or currently affiliated with the institution. So the reports include conduct violations regarding the following. Alcohol, drugs, sexual assault, physical assault, and hazing. Reports are required to be listed in a prominent location on institutional websites for a period of four years. And the institutions are required to update their reports at least 45 calendar days before the start of the fall and spring academic semesters. Institutions must also notify the South Carolina Commission on Higher Education within 14 calendar days after reports have been updated. I mean, that like, but you have to wonder, you know, a situation like this, Would they have reported it? Because I think everybody would have got together and been like, obviously, we can't report this. We can't have anybody know. We've got to protect the fraternity at all costs. I mean, it's it's definitely a great act to have in place. It's just really sad that people will go to the links that they will go to to hide that something like that has been done. Right. So therefore, it's not going to get reported. And then it's this amazing act that has been passed and should be in place is kind of, I don't want to say pointless, but you know what I mean in certain situations because nobody is going to, they're like you said, they're going to try to protect whoever they're going to protect at any cost. Exactly. At any cost. So we're, we're actively hiding things that we know can result in people's death. I mean, this very much reminds me of Class Action Park. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Action Park and like, you know, one of the guys in that documentary said, you should, there should never be a second kid to die in the wave pool. Right. Absolutely. There shouldn't have been a first, but there damn sure shouldn't be a second. Right. What are we doing? Uh Uh-huh. Absolutely. Like, it's, yeah, you're absolutely right. And again, I don't know. I, I feel like I could kick this till it's blue in the face or something, but, like, hazing. I, I'll i just never, I will never understand this. I personally don't like to be in a position of power. I just don't. It's not for me. I like to be um, either equal or somebody, like, give me the information and I do it. I don't, I don't, it's not, I just don't enjoy it. But I can never see myself, I don't understand that mindset of being like, oh, let's pick on that kid because he's, below us like i don't get it i just don't mm-mm, mm-mm. i don't either the tucker w hips memorial foundation was established in tucker's honor and their mission statement states in part 
Quote, with a mission of helping people help others, the Tucker W. Hips Memorial Foundation plans to engage with other community organizations that help the needy and less fortunate by seeking to improve their lives. Tucker knew how blessed he was and he had a passion to help those who were not as blessed. Tucker was not afraid to share his love and joy with anyone, no matter who they were or where they lived. Tucker was a shining light of hope and encouragement to his family and friends, and that hope continues as the foundation strives to minister to those impacted by his life. They hold a charity golf tournament every year. Um, The next will be their ninth year of doing the golf tournament. In March of 2023, they will hold their second annual Tucker W. Hips Memorial Bass Fishing Tournament. Uh, Cindy told a story of when Tucker was younger. He told her that he was going to be a basketball star when he grew up. He told his mom that one day he was going to make her rich and famous, and she said, quote, I don't know about the rich part, and I don't really know about the famous part, but he sure left an impression on this world. Anyone with information that will help the investigation into Tucker's death and help reveal the truth about the events that led to his death are asked to call the Oconee County Sheriff's Office Criminal Investigations Bureau at area code 864-718-1052 and speak with investigator Jimmy Dixon. Anonymous tips can also be given at www.oconeescrimestoppers.com. We'll link below. I cannot physically say that. www.oconeescrimestoppers.com. Yes. And again, we'll have the link and you can just click it. So Messy, we can't, yes, we can't no. read. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of S's and C's together. It did get confusing. Um, Or you could just call 1-888-CRIME-SC. There is a reward of $100,000 for any information that leads to closure in the case. It's sad that some people just can't do the right thing just because it, it weighs heavy on their hearts or they just want to be good people and just come clean and share what happened out of the goodness of their hearts and for his family. It's just, it's sad to me that you need to have a $100,000 reward. But right. that being said, uh, if it helps, I'm super glad about it. And I also just want to say, I hope that none of this made it sound like, I mean, it's not necessarily, it's not, it's not the colleges or the universities that we're coming after. It's the hazing at these places that we're coming after. Because, you know, we talked a lot about Clemson. I don't think it's a bad school at all. But I, I right there. It, it's a com, common theme for different universities across the board that this is happening. And so it, it's got to something has got to change. It's got to stop. Yeah. And. As a university, I mean, I know like here at MTSU, there's what they call Greek row where all the fraternity and sorority houses are. But we can't have sorority houses here. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Fraternity houses. Sorority houses are considered brothels. That makes no f***ing sense. Don't even get us started on that. Um, But you're right. The fraternity houses. But the university makes that happen. I mean, that's they're at the very least complicit in the fact that like all of these houses are dedicated to the fraternities. So as a university, if you are going to participate in at least the facilitation of Greek life on your campus. Mm -hmm. I mean, Clemson had an orientation that says, look at all the benefits of being involved in Greek life. Then it's your responsibility to make sure that shit is done the way it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's not a secret that hazing is an issue. Right. Absolutely. It's your responsibility to keep people safe if you're going to be part of it. If, If Greek life was the secret underground thing where like nobody knew it was happening and it was like very much a secret thing and like the universities didn't know about it and blah 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 I mean I could okay it's hard for us to oversight you know to have any type of oversight but you're actively telling people yeah you should totally get involved in Greek life and I'm not again I don't I think that Greek life can be amazing when it's done correctly and it's been um organized and like you said like when people are overseeing things and just checking in and doing all the right things i mean i just yeah someone's got to give here yeah 100 percent. because there just shouldn't be because again like you there shouldn't be one but there damn sure shouldn't be two Mm -hmm. 
And now we've got yeah. what forty in just from you know two thousand what seven to two thousand seventeen. Seven to two thousand seventeen. Forty in ten up. years, absolutely not. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. But thank you guys so much for listening. And like we said, if you know of anybody or if you have any information on it, please help them out. I mean, it's the least we could do for Tucker and Tucker's family. So absolutely. But thank you guys so much for listening or watching. We love you so much. And we will catch you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.